Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Today's show is brought to you by Nature Box. When the temptation to snack strikes you, it's okay because now you have a smarter way to snack with hundreds of options, none of the guilt. Get your first box right now at naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. I've been laughing my ass off today. We've been uh, revisiting on Netflix the first three Rambo films, which just released. Now, I'm going to digress here at the beginning of the show. So for those who say we should immediately get into the heart and the meat of the matter, the hard data, you're going to hate this. This is my sandbox. Just chill. Just fast forward a couple minutes if it bothers you. All right. It just on my mind, I thought it was funny. I see it. There's First Blood, First Blood Part 2, Rambo 3, right there on Netflix. And I, being an 80s child, saw the Rambo films in their first run release. In fact, Rambo, First Blood Part 2, the second film out of four, I think. There's going to be a five. They're, Stallone's making Rambo 5, okay? Just let that one sink in. But back to the second film, it was 1985, and my older brother... Ask if I wanted to go to the movies with him, which really never happened. Hardly ever. Hey, you want to go hang out? And I was delighted. I get a chance to go and catch an action flick with my older brother. A flick that's rated R, which in my family is taboo. The dreaded R, restricted, was just not done. You don't go. They had no idea why it was rated R. They had no idea what criteria the Motion Picture Association of America was using to rate it R. They didn't care. It had an R. It's got an R. You're not going. You're forbidden. You know. So Terry says, hey, let's go and let's catch Rambo. First blood part. I'm in. I'm in. So we go to a packed theater. I think it was opening weekend in 1985. And it is raucous. Everybody's cheering and and we left thinking this is the action flick of our lifetime. This is this is an iconic action film for the ages. And of course, five minutes later, we realize it's the unintentional comedy of the ages. And I had a chance to catch Rambo again on Netflix. I couldn't help myself. I was feeling nostalgic about uh, that particular time in my life. So I sit back. I found myself just uh, just laughing out loud. And so I did a short synopsis of the film on Facebook for other 80s children like me and for those who have seen the film and are familiar with this particular movie, and people seem to have gotten a kick out of it. I'll just read it for you here real fast as we sort of warm up this show, just for a laugh. It goes like this. After his previous antics in First Blood where John Rambo essentially dropped a carnage bomb on Sheriff Teasel's town. He's given less prison time than the average pot dealer. This prison literally has sweaty inmates pounding boulders with sledgehammers. This is hard labor, right? This is how bad Rambo has it. Colonel Troutman informs Rambo that the billion-dollar United States military machine and its 1.3 million active military personnel aren't qualified to sneak into a Vietnamese jungle to take pictures. Rambo discovers that the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, still wearing 60s-era uniforms, by the way, has been harboring American POWs for the sole purpose of keeping them in a bamboo-caged cave. No negotiations, no demands. They just like having POWs. And they apparently became attached to their little camp, which is still humming along over a decade after the Vietnam War has ended. Rambo (gasps) discovers POWs. 
And the powers that be, who apparently didn't see the problem with dropping a mentally unstable, trained killer into enemy territory, abandon him to be captured and tortured by a sneering Russian named Podovsky, who tells Rambo, You may scream, there is no shame. I can't do Russian, sorry. Our hero escapes because his captors thought it perfectly acceptable to leave his lethal arms and legs unshackled so he could use the radio. By the way, the pretty lady with the machine gun sitting below the floor also comes in handy. Approximately seven trillion bullets are fired in Rambo's direction. Fortunately, the North Vietnamese Army apparently all attended the Imperial Stormtrooper Shooting Academy. And John Rambo's only casualties are a few leech marks and a chic hot knife scar under his left eye. Ten bullets are fired at the woman. She dies. Rambo then gets an armed helicopter. Everything dies. Upon his triumphant rescue of the POWs and the return to base, John Rambo assaults an American serviceman and empties an M60 E3 machine gun into hugely expensive military computers which resemble the sets from Lost in Space. He then threatens the mission commander at knife point before Colonel Troutman declares him a free man. Rambo, having no food, guns, or even a shirt, is allowed to walk from the compound into foreign lands without so much as a signature from a desk clerk. I love this movie. It's up there with Commando, which is another 80s action classic. Those films where everybody gets killed, but nobody gets hurt. <laughs> Those kind of films. So we've been having a laugh about that on uh, Facebook today. I still love the 80s. They say that the songs and the films and the pop culture icons that you grow up with become kind of the soundtrack of your life. And while I don't live in the past, there are moments where they recall certain things. And, you know, hanging out in the theater with my brother was kind of a big deal for me. You know, that's the memory it brings to mind. And, of course, the invincible American hero <laughs> who takes on the entire North Vietnamese army and uh, escapes without a scratch. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's embarrassing. It really it kind of is. FYI, and I know I'm talking about a local event to a, an international audience, but tomorrow night, uh, just FYI, if you are anywhere near Tulsa, Oklahoma, my hometown, we're doing a sushi dinner together. I had this little spot over near 71st and Memorial called Soban Sushi. It's a little family-owned place, and, and I just love them. And the problem is, is that I don't think anybody knows that they're there, right? So every time I go in there, the place is always empty. And I lament that because their food is really, really good. So I ask them, you know, hey, would it be okay if we picked a night and I brought some friends with me? And they're like, well, how many? And I'm like, well, probably 50. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Tomorrow night, Wednesday night, the 16th of September, 2015, we're all going to meet at 6.30 p.m. at this Sushi place, Soban Sushi at 72nd and Memorial. If I know, I know. But if you're anywhere near Tulsa, Oklahoma, and you want to join us, you can RSVP on my Facebook page right now. We're just going to bring some heathenry and shenanigans to a sushi house, a little local family-owned place I think could use the support. You know, when you see somebody who does something well, you want to see them succeed. And, and you know, I see so many chains out there. I've, I've really got a thing for mom-and-pop shops. These people have put everything they've got into making something successful, and they're probably working almost 24 hours a day and every weekend, and it's been years and whatnot. So I thought this might be a nice shot in the arm for those guys. Again, you can go to my Facebook page and see the RSVP for that coming up tomorrow night. I'm looking forward to hanging out with my fellow infidels. It's going to be a great time. Last thing, real fast, before we get into the heart of the show. I was talking to Sarah Moorhead, who is sort of the main admin for Apostacon going on this weekend in Dallas. Penn and Teller are doing the big Friday night thing. I just had Penn Gillette on the radio. And a lot of people, I guess, are confused thinking they have to buy whole weekend passes to go see Penn & Teller Friday night. That's when Penn & Teller are going to be there for their evening of magical inquiry. 
Well, no, you don't have to buy whole weekend passes. They got like one day tickets just so you can go and see the Penn and Teller show. I lament I can't get there because I'm doing a tour in North and South Carolina this weekend. And it grieves me that I'll miss Apostacon, although I'm delighted about the tour stops that are coming up for me. I, I just, you know, Penn and Teller, they're awesome. They're fantastic. They're going to do, I think, uh, some Q&A with the audience, a lot of interaction. That's Friday night. And there's a one-day thing if you decide you want to go Friday night. Apostacon.org, I'm guessing, would be the best site to go to get those tickets. But, uh, you know, you want to check that. My special guest on the radio tonight is Chris Matheson. He's the author of a new book called The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. We'll get to that conversation and an excerpt from the book here in just a second. But first, as I get older, nature's practical joke continues to rear its ugly head. More and more, I love really good food, right? But I ain't 21 anymore. I don't have the metabolism of a 21-year-old, which means bigger snacks, bigger slacks, right? Well, Nature Box has been part of my solution to better health. I changed my diet, got back on the tennis court, down about 25 pounds. I'm skipping the greasy potato chips, the candy bars, the salty, fatty, unhealthy snack choices I used to make because they were easy choices. I've got something easier. Nature Box has hundreds of really good snacks boxed up and delivered in my mailbox, hence the box in Nature Box. A great variety so I don't get bored, ingredients that don't make me feel guilty, and of course the smart snack guarantee. So if anything doesn't work for me, Nature Box will replace it in the next month's box. So try them out. Check out the pumpkin spice nom noms, the coconut cashews, the Fuji apples. The PB&J granola, and so much more. Get your first box right now. Go to naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. It's snackisfaction. Guaranteed. Naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Chris Matheson is a writer and director. Got on the map back in 1989 with a little comedy film called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. He was also involved in the writing of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, the sequel, and he's been involved in Hollywood off and on since that time, most currently working on a revisit of a popular TV series from, I think it was late 1970s or early 1980s, The Greatest American Hero, which starred at the time William Catt, about a guy who stumbles upon a superhero suit, but he can't find the instructions. He has no idea how to make it work correctly, and so he bumbles and bumbles as he attempts to do good. It was really a great series for its time. And he's involved in a TV movie revisit of that story. And, of course, he's author of the brand new book called The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. Chris Matheson joins us tonight. Thanks for being here, man. Great to have you. Uh, My pleasure to be here. Let's start with your resume. You are one of the writers or the writer of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure or what? I'm one of the two writers of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. So we're both 80s children, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, everybody Wang Chung tonight. That's my generation, man. Cool. How old are you, Chris? I am 56. You're more of a 70s guy, probably. Then, I right? am more of a 70s guy, actually. So where did Bill and Ted come from? Because, I mean, that's quintessential 80s, uh, I would think. Bill and Ted was sort of a amalgamation of guys that both Ed and I knew. Ed Solomon was my co-writer on the Bill and Ted movies. And, and, and we both in high school in the 1970s, which means that the 1970s and 1980s apparently we're not that different in this respect. We, we just knew guys who were like that. And we thought that we were writing those guys. It turns out it, we were essentially writing ourselves. I mean, we didn't really quite realize it at the time, but of course we were, because that's to do ultimately. But yeah, they were just guys that, that we sort of knew and were just really into headbanger rock and roll music and uh, seemed kind of out of it. The guys that we knew probably seemed stoned a lot, although Bill and Ted are not and never were. Bill and Ted are, are really, like, they don't smoke pot at all. That's not their thing. But probably the guys that we were inspired by maybe were. I always wondered about Alex Winter, you know, because Keanu Reeves goes off, who'd have thunk 
back in the day. <laughs> you know, when Bill and Ted comes out, what is that, 89-ish? 80, 89, yeah. Uh, you know, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Who would have thought that Keanu would have gone into the sort of celebrity stratosphere? And then Alex Winter always thought, well, I wonder what happened to that dude. You know, is he producer, director, something along those lines? Well, Alex was always, was always really more inclined towards directing, and that's pretty much what he's done since then. He he sort of dipped a, a toe into acting for a few years there, and he did Mill and Ted, and he did Lost Boys and a few other movies. But, oh, that's right. He was in The Lost Boys. Yeah, he's one of The I, Lost Boys. But he, he was a film major at NYU when, when we met him, and he's he's a director. That's, that's what he does. In fact, he just had a movie come out recently that I haven't seen. I've heard it's great. And what have you been doing since 89? <laughs> just sitting around. You're just you sitting know, on your ass. Just hanging, just hanging. Now, were, have you always it. been an, a skeptic, a non-believer in the Bible? Because we're about to get into the fact that you've rewritten the Bible, you arrogant, arrogant man. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, an arrogant thing to do with me. Yeah, very arrogant to think that you could write a... Actually, my Yorkie could write a better Bible than the Bible. But I, you've done a brilliant job, and I want to get to that. But have you always been a skeptic? Probably not. I think I was interested and sort of drawn to it. My wife and uh, my friend Ed, who I wrote Bill and Ted with, they, they used to kind of look at me in the early 90s, I think, and wonder whether I was going to end up being a Christian because I, I had this weird fascination with it. I never felt like I was going to be. I never, ever had one second where I was actually thinking I would become a Christian, but I wasn't really sure I, I wasn't a believer by any means. What about the family, though, growing up? Not a religious family, but a uh, a lot of dogma in the family that I grew up with. A lot of very strong beliefs. I mean, a degree of religion. If you consider Southern California, New Agey, 70s stuff, religion, it, it kind of is, it kind of isn't. I mean, the new, the whole New Age thing is so unformed it's so kind of piecemeal it's like a little bit of this little you know a little bit of bigfoot a little bit of pyramids yeah i mean the west coast is like the cafeteria plan of spirituality no it totally is it totally is and what does it amount to really i mean is there any center to it not necessarily but there's a a lot of beliefs And, and so there was i grew up around a lot of that you know a lot of astrology on the one hand and on the other hand kind of a a lot of dogmatic beliefs about the nature of a family and, and how it should be. And so a lot of authority, I guess I'd say, a lot of truth. And I didn't much like it. And I think if you grow up in that kind of environment, and maybe most of us do, I don't really know. Uh, I know I did. And eventually you reach a point where you have to either kind of agree to it and just go, right, I accept that. Right. That I'm going to live in that truth. I buy that. That's right. I'm good with that. Or you don't. And you just think, well, I don't, that, I don't like that. That, that doesn't that doesn't work for me in in which case i think you sort of rebel so it's obvious from the book you're a smart ass um (laughs) this normally does not develop late in life it's normally something i think people are kind of they just are right you've always been kind of that snarky dude probably right is that a good guess i don't know about that i think i was so shy and so introverted and so insecure that whatever smart ass qualities I had didn't really manifest themselves until probably my my twenties. I was I was a very very insecure kid, and um, I certainly didn't think of myself that way. I don't know whether anybody else perceived me that way. I would doubt it. How does a guy as shy as you were then in your teen years break into quote unquote show business? I mean, you got this big screenwriting credit. How does this happen? Well, a lot of it is just bumping into Ed Solomon, who was very, very good at the whole Hollywood thing and knew how to do it. And then we wrote Bill and Ted. And to some degree, you could be a Martian. And if you create something people like, it it just, it doesn't matter. You know, you could live in Siberia. You could be Ted Kaczynski and live in a hovel and in under the railroad tracks and it, it just it wouldn't really matter because the if they like the material they like the material and people like to go dead so that kind of did it isn't hollywood kind of creatively dead these days i mean it's a sequel of a rehash <laughs> of a remake of a reboot of a sequel i mean 
I'm aching for instead of the you know 150 million dollar Michael Bay spectacle. I'm aching for these sort of nuanced, weird, experimental indie flicks out there. I, and I don't know if there's a maybe a sine wave in the entertainment industry where where films kind of boomerang out of the high budget back to the more independent. But I, I find myself a little frustrated. I mean, there's not a lot. There's nothing new under the sun, it seems. Yeah, that, that would seem to be true for big movies these days. I mean, interesting movies do continue to get made somehow by sheer force of will and, and tremendous talent. Certain people do manage to to pull it off. But it's very, very difficult, and there are an awful lot of sequels and an awful lot of superhero movies and an awful lot of movies where New York City gets destroyed and an awful lot of movies that kind of the music feels like dun, dun, you know, that, <laughs> that thing, and it's really old. And uh, Everything has been Hans Zimmerfied. Everything. Yeah, it's has dull. Been Hans it's dull. So, People say that there's a lot of great TV now. I don't I don't really watch a lot of TV, but that's kind of what I hear, that there's a lot of good stuff on television. I don't know. <laughs> I've digressed enough. I'm talking here with writer, director, actor Chris Matheson. And when I say writer, it's because I'm holding in my hands right here a book called The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. And if you open it up. It says, based on a true story, and the words true story are crossed out, and it says, based on the Bible. And it sets the tone for the rest of this. So, have you sort of synopsized the whole Bible? Did you go through it and say, let's filter this sacred work, this sacred tome, through the the lens of smartassery (laughs) that is Chris Matheson? What was your take on the book? What is it? I did want to tell the whole story. I wanted to, I I read the book a number of times because I was just sort of drawn to it. It's really fascinating. And from a comedy writer's standpoint, it's gold because it's found, it's, What's you that? read the whole Bible? I did, my, several times. So and so begat, so and so begat, so and so who begat, so and so. Oh, my. yeah. I mean, there are well, parts of it which are just somnex for the eyes. There are, there are, but there are parts that are really just so much fun and vivid and 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 ludicrous. Uh, you know, I, I was primarily drawn to the ludicrous, and those were the pages that, as I went through, I, I would just highlight them and just go, "Oh my." God, this is fantastic. This is so bizarre. This makes no sense. And at a certain point, I just thought, this character, this God guy, he's a freak, man. He's like, (laughs) what is the deal with this guy? This guy doesn't make any sense. He's so mercurial, and he's so bizarre, and he's so mean, and he's so... And it makes no sense, because fundamentally, if you think about it, he made everything. He's all powerful. He did the whole thing. And yet he's always mad. He's always upset. He's always frustrated that things aren't going the way he wants, even though he made them. So I thought, well, who is this guy? I want to try to just get inside his head to some degree. It's not a first person narrative. I'm not telling it from his point of view, but it's kind of like you're right on his shoulder and you're right there as he's going from the beginning, you know, sitting in the dark pre uh, let there be light, just sitting there in the darkness, which he presumably did eternally until he decided he wanted some light to revelations, which is the grand finale of this guy's journey and where he completely freaks out and turns into a James Bond supervillain and is just like the most evil character you can possibly conceive of. And I just, I wanted to track him from the, I take him uh, on the whole journey. And that's what I tried to do. From the first chapter, God was delighted. He could do this after he had said, let there be light and light appeared. He could do this. He could make things happen, create whatever reality he felt like. It was an extraordinary moment for him. An unwanted thought crossed God's mind. Was someone already there who responded to my command? Impossible. He was God. He was alone. You raise some great questions. What's Yahweh doing in the void before he creates the heavens and the earth? And if he's giving a command, who's the recipient of the command? I hadn't yeah. thought of it in those terms before. Yeah, who's he talking to? Is he talking to himself? Let there be light. I'm just going to say it out loud, <laughs> you know, to myself, and that'll make me do it. 
or is he talking to somebody else? Did, is, is somebody else implementing his command? Like, let there be light. Yes, sir. Let's do it. It's really not clear, but it's very strange the way he, he makes those kind of we references early on. Like, we should do this. We should do that. These bizarre implications early on that there's other gods there. Uh, they're strange. Those are strange things. And not to mention the, the very weird fact that water seems to be there right from the beginning. Like, what's the deal with that? He's over the water. There's nothing, but there's water. Like, did he not make water? And he has a very bizarre relationship with water anyway. He seems kind of scared of it, kind of unnerved by it. You know, he gets he's, he later gets all excited talking about his pet dragon whale who, who lives <laughs> in the water. And, and when he kills everything off, he doesn't kill the water creatures, notice. You know, the water creatures get a huge windfall of free food. You know, it doesn't, he doesn't harm them. So he's got a, he's got a very strange relationship with water. Because it's there. He either made it and forgot about it or didn't make it at all. Another striking aspect they never teach you when you are a small child in vacation Bible school that you draw <laughs> yeah. a huge circle around in your book is God's propensity to act surprised. <laughs> Shit happens and he looks around and goes, well, God, that didn't work out. Right. You know, it's, I, you know I, what am I going to do now? Now right. I've got to go and, you know, I've got to fix this. Well, yeah, wait this a completely unforeseen problem that I created. I always like to quote my buddy, Matt Dillahunty, who talks about the all-powerful wizard who created imperfect creatures and then had the nerve to act surprised and offended when they acted imperfectly. I always thought that was a great deal. You know, if you're going to create imperfect things and then they screw up or they act in a random or aberrant way, you look at him and you go, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. It just doesn't make any sense. I ended up feeling like, of course, well, we're created in his image, number one. I mean, we're, that's stated pretty explicitly. So he wouldn't really, the character, I think if you read the whole book, or what I ended up feeling strongly is he doesn't want perfection. He's a drama queen. He wants it to go bad. He loves that it goes bad. He loves it when humans misbehave. He loves it because then he can punish them. He can, it's a big show. It's a big emotional roller coaster. You know, if Adam and Eve just stayed in the garden and they didn't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they just behaved themselves, it's like, well, that's boring. You know, just this one couple in a garden. It's like, no, they misbehave. Punish them. Then you can forgive them. Then you can punish them again. It's this whole sick cycle that begins in, in the Garden of Eden. And he loves it. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's a great emotional experience for him. And we're, you know, we, we get whipsawed around. Human beings in this story get whipsawed around because he, he kind of loves punishing us so much, all of us. You know, even the ones he likes. He likes almost nobody. He hates almost everybody. He hates almost every creature that he makes in his own image, which says a lot about him, I think. And even the ones he likes, he hates and punishes worse than anyone. I don't think he wanted perfection because presumably he could have had it, right? If he's a perfect being, he could have created it to begin with. He think he actually kind of likes to keep it interesting. Huh? I do. I do. I think that's, I think, I think he, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think he's got a very almost bottomless self-hatred and it's a weird psychodrama. I ended up feeling like, okay, this guy is one of three things. He's either a fraud. He's either the wizard of Oz. I mean, either he doesn't really have the power that he says he does that's kind of funny. I mean, I find that amusing. Or he does have all that power, but he's really not that smart. He's like a god with an IQ of 98. You know, he's kind of a fool. It's kind of the Will Ferrell as God character, where he just is like, oh, you know, he just makes these bonehead moves, like creating two sons for uh, Adam and Eve, you know, instead of having a daughter there. Or another family, maybe, even, to start mankind with. Or the most interesting one, and the most compelling one, and the one that I think is ultimately the most persuasive, is he's a freak. It's a huge, complicated, bizarre, sick, hilarious, by the way, hilarious psychodrama, where this guy really does hate himself for a variety of reasons. And the whole thing is kind of a manifestation of that. When you talk about how he likes the drama... He likes to punish. I'm going back in my mind. I don't know why I pinballed to this weird reference. It's kind of niche. But there was another 80s film called Time Bandits. I always think of the Ian Holm Napoleon character 
who right. loved puppet shows where little things were always hitting and hurting each other. He just <laughs> he was he loved to see the influence and the inflicting of pain. It gave him great joy and <laughs> it had made him feel large. It made him feel powerful. Right. And it was sort of his way of being entertained as the ruler of all things. That's kind of how I see Yahweh now. Yeah. Do you have a, a favorite Bible story, Chris Matheson? Is there, if you had to pick one, is there one in there that's just especially near and dear to your heart that you enjoyed writing about the most? Yeah, I think so. If I had to pick one, I would, I would have to say it's the book of Job. And uh, it's the book of Job partially because it is generally perceived to be one of the crown jewels of the Bible, that it is generally perceived to be kind of beautiful and spiritually profound and uh, kind of a, a great theodicy in some ways. And in fact, I think it's a, a, a brilliant, subversive piece of satire. I think, I think it's the first piece of satire. I think Solomon wrote it. I think he knew Solomon's the guy, man. You know, you read that book carefully. The only one who's really, really smart, the only one who's trying to reform it, who's got some big, interesting ideas is, is Solomon. Of course, he fails utterly, but he's trying. He's interjecting doubt. He's interjecting, he's, he's, he's interjecting sex. I mean, uh, in Song of Songs, and he's interjecting really dark themes in Ecclesiastes. And I think he, nobody knows who wrote the book of Job. I think he wrote the book of Job. I think it's pretty obvious thematically how it's linked to Ecclesiastes. And in the book of Job, it's a beautiful piece of satire because God completely falls apart. I mean, he's he's revealed in this one story as a bully, a braggart, a lightweight, potentially just kind of a, an empty suit, uh, a fraud, and most fascinatingly and hilariously, mentally ill. He, he When he starts yelling at Job in the end, Job, poor pathetic Job, who's been completely destroyed and is laying there covered with boils with his 10 children killed and all of his you know wealth wiped out and god starts berating him from heaven yelling down at him from heaven and god's monologue at the end of job is one of the most perfect pieces of character comedy i've ever read in my life because he just kind of spins out and he starts getting kind of irrational and saying things that don't really make sense as beautiful. I, I adore it. That's what I, I originally, I was just going to kind of do that. I was just going to kind of do the book of Job. And and then I decided to, to do the whole thing because I thought it was, well, I, I thought it was so much fun. But that book of Job is, is tremendous. I've never understood why God felt the necessity to impress his arch enemy, right? Satan goes up and Satan kind of challenges <laughs> him and said, well, what about Job down here? And God gives a shit what Satan thinks <laughs> yeah. about this scenario. I have never understood. I thought, why do you care what Satan thinks? You're looking for Satan's approval? I mean, that almost is like one of the jealous Greek gods who's trying to puff his chest out kind of a scenario, you know? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll show you who's got power. I'll show you who's the best god. And then he creates this weird gauntlet of pain for Job, who loses his children, and he loses his health, and he loses everything he's got. And... um there is a video about the Job story that was animated on YouTube. You can find mm -hmm. it still. I believe it's called the Goon Bible Project, if anybody wants it. Just look up the book of Job. I think it's Goon Bible Project. And somebody actually animated this bizarre scenario and did a much better job than I think I could have ever done. Uh, it's worth seeking on, on uh, YouTube if you get a chance. So far, good reviews on the book, yeah? Yeah, I think so. I, 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 yeah. You yeah, got Jerry people, Coyne, people you got Shermer, you got Bogosian weighing in. Lawrence uh, Krauss. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's it's good. I mean, I, I think people find it funny, and I'm gratified by that. I, I want people to find it funny. This the, the, the thing is laughable, right? I mean, this is the ultimate emperor's new clothes, the Bible. It, it's absurd to take this book seriously. It's, it's, a, it's a ridiculous book. The story's absurd. The character is absurd. And I wanted to just kind of hold up a mirror to it in a way. It's like, well, this is it. I mean, that's why I have all the 
biblical citations. It's like, look, this is the book. This, this I'm not making up a lot of this stuff. This how is are you how categorized on Amazon? Are you listed under religion or are you under comedy, comedy religion? I mean, what I'm going at is, is a religious person going to stumble upon this sucker and then start cranking out the hate, <laughs> you know, and then, you know, send you a, a dead rodent in the mail or something, you know? <laughs> Pre- presumably, yes. Presumably, that's just a matter of time. No dead rodents yet, Seth, but I'm, I'm sure it's imminent. Chris Matheson, The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love. And hey, with your permission, I'll grab an excerpt and actually cap the show with it tonight. And of course, I'll link the book in the description box. I do this kind of thing because I think these works have merit. I think it's good sometimes. I think it's healthy to ridicule the ridiculous. And I just think it's really entertaining. Very well done. Thank you very much. Thanks for being on the radio. We'll watch the book on the charts here in the rankings in the weeks ahead, okay? Thanks very much. Great talking to you. Difficult to choose an excerpt from the book. There's a lot of good stuff in here. And obviously, it's a linear story, so I'm always picking up in the middle of whatever God is doing. I think I'll start here at the beginning of chapter 2. We've already started creation as God discovers himself in the darkness. There's water floating in the void somehow below him. He decides to create land and plants. And uh, he discovered that he himself had... Physical features, legs and arms, a penis and testicles. So that was chapter one. Let's get into chapter two, and I'll start at the very beginning. It says this. There earth sat, dotted with fruit trees, which now had sunlight to help them grow, which was good. But other than trees, it was quiet. The trees and the plants didn't do anything. They were certainly not capable of loving him, which was God now understood all he really wanted. The plants and the trees were, yes, alive, but they were so boring. They just sort of sat there doing nothing. God decided to fill the water with living, active creatures. He called them fish. He decided to fill the air with flying creatures. He called birds, Genesis chapter 1, verse 20. God liked birds at first, but quickly became annoyed with their loud, squawky voices. The smart ones, like crows and parrots, particularly irked him. Shut up, he would find himself thinking as he listened to them chatter. Before long, he'd be happy to have all the birds killed. God thought the fish were fine. They didn't do anything he disliked. God also created a few sea monsters on this day. Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. God made a speech to the birds and the fish, welcoming them to earth and giving them a sense of direction. Getting them off to a solid start, basically. He thought about what to say, then decided he'd found the perfect note to strike. Be fruitful and multiply, he told them. Genesis 1.22 Which seemed like an excellent message. Until that damned self-critical voice piped up again. They're fish and birds. They don't understand you. You do know that, right? God hated it when he had thoughts like these. They ruined what had been a highly productive day. He'd planned on making more living things, but he went to sleep instead. Also, he lied to himself, I'm still tired from creating the whole universe yesterday, all those trillions of stars. God woke up the next day, refreshed, ready to continue. Let there be tiny creeping things, he commanded, quite pleased with that description of insects. Insects seemed like a splendid idea to God, not least because some of them would be good to eat. Leviticus 11.22 God then created mammals, and he felt very good about them, especially cows, which he instantly knew would taste delicious. Genesis 1.25 I never created reptiles, God later realized, and that bothered him. Who did create them? Why, the same person who created mushrooms and lobsters and crabs and snails and everything else I never mentioned. Me! Who else could have? Another God? They don't even exist. So how could they have? The stage was set. There was land, water, trees, insects, fish, birds, cows, the whole planet— was teeming with life, and that was good. Although, you know, utterly pointless. God didn't actually care about any of these creatures, and here's why. Because they didn't care about him. Chimps, elephants, dolphins, wolves. It was time to create the creature that would love him. God had been planning this creature, the final and most important one, for a while now. 
He would be called human, and he would look just like God. God was thrilled by the idea. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, God heard himself command. Genesis 1.26, which is strange. Why had he said that? He quickly wondered. In our image, in our likeness? What did that mean? Am I so pompous that I refer to myself as us, he wondered? Or did he, on some level, think he wasn't alone, that there were other gods up in the sky with him? This thought bothered God a lot. He didn't want there to be other gods. It made him mad to think that there were. But what if there were, and the humans, his special creatures, somehow perversely, ended up liking those other gods more than they liked him, which is exactly what would happen God already knew in his heart. Maybe it was a slip of the tongue, God thought. Maybe he'd meant to say, in my image, in my likeness, and had said, in our image, in our likeness, by accident. And that could happen to anyone. He wasn't going to worry about it, he told himself. In truth, he worried about it constantly. Just as God would create man in his own image, he would also create the man's companion, woman, he called her, in his image. Or, you know, sort of. Not exactly, obviously. I mean, God wasn't a woman, but he would create her in his likeness, except for the fact that she was, you know, female. What are you, some sort of she-male? Satan would ask him much later when they were about to fight over the final destiny of humankind, but that's jumping ahead. Anyway, no, God was not a she-male. He made woman in his image, but he was all man. What was strange about that? God hesitated. Why did he even need women? Why couldn't there just be males? Why couldn't they give birth out their anuses? No, no, it wouldn't work. Women were, sadly, necessary. With regard to woman's creation, God considered two options. One was to basically make her at the exact same time as the man. That seemed like a good idea. God decided to do that. Then he decided he'd make the man first and create the woman from the man's rib. Then he decided that he would do both. Can I do that, he wondered? And then instantly rejoindered with, I can do anything. I'm God. I can make the man first and also create them at the same time. Watch me. So he did. But it was a little confusing. Genesis 1.27 versus Genesis 2.7. The two extra humans that God made, he put in cages where they lived for a while and then died when he forgot to feed them. Then the man God named Adam, the woman He didn't give a name to, he just called her woman, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. She was certainly attractive. The man obviously thought so. His penis made that obvious. God did not like the way that looked. The first chance I get, I'm going to make them cover up, he thought to himself. Their nudity really bothers me. But for now, he'd let them be naked. It was distracting, though. In the days since discovering his own testicles, God had had a change of heart. He couldn't help but notice what attractive balls Adam had. Perfect was the word that came to mind. Adam's penis was very nice looking too, although something wasn't quite right. It definitely needed a change. After thinking about it for a while, God decided the man's penis could use one important fix— If the skin at the head of it was trimmed away, it would look even better. Good idea, God thought to himself. God honestly couldn't grasp what exactly Adam found so alluring about the woman. Not only was she less interesting to God, my story will revolve around men, he murmured to himself. He also sensed something. What? Bad about her, something strange and hidden and disruptive. He didn't trust her. He just made her, and already he wondered if he'd made a mistake. She's going to create problems, he thought. She's trouble. I can feel it. Still, it was with an amazing feeling of pride and accomplishment that God looked down upon his glorious creation. This is very good, he said to himself. Genesis 1, 31. And yet, Those damned, dark thoughts always seemed to creep in. Where did they come from? 
He had no idea. He'd have eliminated them if he could, but he couldn't seem to. It's a perfect creation, and my two humans, Adam and woman, will be happy and content within it. As I wish them to be, they will live within their beautiful garden forever, and they will love me, and that will be wonderful, God told himself. But he knew it wasn't true. And that is part of the Creation Chronicle from Chris Matheson's humorous book called The Story of God, a biblical comedy about love and hate. You can find it on Amazon pretty much anywhere, and I'll link it again in the description box of this show. I'll see you this weekend on the tours in North and South Carolina. There will not be a podcast next Tuesday. We're going to take one week off. I'll see you back here in two weeks. Thank you so much again to our sponsor. It is Nature Box, a smarter way to snack Hundreds of options, none of the guilt. Get your first box now, naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Naturebox.com slash thinking atheist. Follow the Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on the Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. Thethinkingatheist.com.